Living a life of love, that's our theme. Loving God and neighbor really lies at the heart, the very heart of life with God. We all know this, I'm sure. Uh, Jesus certainly taught it and demonstrated it perfectly, and he calls his fellow followers to make love their highest priority. It's to be the goal of our life, the highest and greatest thing that we aspire to. And loving God and loving our neighbor is to guide all that we think and say and do. Now, this is vital to our souls, the health of our souls. C.S. Lewis says this, Every Christian would agree that a man's spiritual health is exactly proportional to his love for God. Ever thought of that? That your spiritual health is exactly proportional to your love for God. In today's self-absorbed and narcissistic culture, our great need is to focus our attention and our intention on loving God and loving others if we are to avoid spiritual ruin. Now, obviously, we cannot cover this theme in the depth and detail that it requires in, in uh, one lecture. But what I will try to do this morning is to give a biblical overview, emphasizing the nature of and the essential truths about loving God and our neighbor, uh, explaining along the way how we grow in that. And we will do this uh, really working mostly out of the great commandment. So you're familiar, I'm sure, with the great commandment. We find it in um, Matthew 22, 34 through 40 this morning, although it uh, originates in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter uh, 6. Let me read it to you from the English Standard Version. <clears throat> when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And the importance of this particular passage in the Bible cannot be overstated. Jonathan Edwards says of this, It is doubtless true and evident from these scriptures that the essence of all true religion lies in holy love and in that divine affection and a habitual disposition to it, and the light which is the foundation of it, and those things which are the fruit of it. And these consist the whole of religion. Thus, we really are uh, studying the core, the radioactive core of biblical truth and biblical ethics here this morning. Uh, we need a little context to help us before we jump into the passage, so let me sketch out just a few things for you. Um, the Pharisees, as we probably all know, were enemies of Jesus, and we often see them looking for ways to trap him or ensnare him in what he says. Uh, now, they had counted up uh, in the Old Testament a total of 613 commands, some positive, some negative. And they argued endlessly about which was the most important. They thought this was a great minefield into which to lure Jesus. And so that lies behind this question that we uh, hear from the lawyer. And we see here that Jesus responds by quoting the foundational text in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 4, the great Shema, which uh, Jews still to this day uh, repeat regularly. Well, let's take a look then at what it really means to love God. We'll look first at loving God, and then we'll look at uh, loving our neighbor and different aspects of loving our neighbor. 
Uh, the first thing we need to do is to uh, look at the word love, lest we go astray by reading into it our contemporary notions of feeling and sentiment. As you know from your readings, um, there were four Greek words that were used for love in the New Testament. Uh, well, not in the New Testament, but in the Greek language. And uh, the first one is eros. That focuses primarily on the attractive qualities of the object, and it's not found in the New Testament. Uh, the second one is storge, which relates more to family love, and it's not found in the New Testament either. Then you have philia, which is a, a warm, affectionate kind of love, the love of friendship um, and intimacy that is found in the New Testament, along with the final word, agape, which is the word that is used for talking about loving God and loving our neighbor. It appears uh, far more than uh, philia, and uh, with its verb form together, and it focuses uh, on uh, really the will. It doesn't focus on feelings. And that comes as a surprise to many people when we talk about uh, love, because we're so oriented in our culture to thinking that love is, is first and foremost a matter of feeling. C.S. Lewis uh, puts it this way, <clears throat> and he was a, uh, an expert in, in uh, the Greek language. He said, Christian love either towards God or towards man is an affair of the will. An affair of the will. Now, feeling is involved, of course, but it's not the dominant element at all. The will is the dominant element in agape. Well, let's look at some of the characteristics of agape as it's directed toward God. Uh, number one, agape or love for God is an exclusive love. We read in the Old Testament, you shall have no other gods before me. Or Jesus, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount says, no one can serve two masters. God is the creator of heaven and earth and all that is seen and unseen. And he demands to be first. And he tolerates no rivals. Love for God is an all-encompassing love. We see it in the text here, don't we? We see those words, all your heart. That is, your whole personality, your whole self. And then it's elaborated in all your soul, emotional and volitional power, all your strength, all your mind, uh, for, rather, the cognitive and mental abilities. And then Mark adds in his, in his uh, uh, account all your strength, the physical capacities. Well, that encompasses all that we are. Nothing is left outside. An all-encompassing love is what uh, we are called to. And then an obedient love. We read in Deuteronomy 11, 12 to 13, and now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear, to re revere the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. You see what's going on there? It's knowing loving, serving, obeying God. That lies at the heart of what we're talking about. Uh, over in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 5, we read this. This is love for God, to obey His commands. And His commands are not burdensome. Is that the way you think of God's commands? Certainly, that's the biblical view. God's commands are not burdensome. Because if our hearts have been changed by His grace, we desire to please Him. And so we don't regard His commands and, and His will as something that's burdensome. 
Jesus makes it uh, even simpler in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 15. He simply says, if you love me, you will obey me. That's about as straightforward as, as one can be. Well, what are the ramifications of this for our daily lives? First, it calls us to put God first and foremost in our lives. We are to forsake and abandon all the idols that we find in our hearts. Now, idols, the word can uh, cause us to think of totem poles or carved stones or uh, things of that sort that are more um, concrete in nature. Today, in our culture, we don't have idols quite like that. Uh, they're different in a kind of secularized Western culture. They are things, or can be, things like career, personal success, reputation, money, pleasure, and sex. Sex can become an idol. You can become addicted to sex. It's the center of your life. And everything sort of revolves around it. And there are others we could cite as well. We're called on to abandon and forsake these things and put God first, to say a consistent no to our self-centered life and desires, and to live a God-centered life. Now, saying no isn't simply uh, a matter of, of um, screwing things down tightly and um, forcing yourself to live uh, a very unhappy, unattractive life. It's saying no so that you can say yes. It's saying no to the things that stand in the way of living a God-centered life. So it's not really a negative idea so much as it is a positive idea. No in order to get to yes. Secondly, loving God involves embracing His will as we find it in the Scripture. Taking it as our rule and guide for all of life. This includes our worldview, allowing Scripture to shape our worldview. And many of us, our worldview is shaped by the culture. Various aspects and facets of secular culture have shaped our worldview, which filters down into our um, behavior on a daily basis. And we wonder, why am I doing that? Why am I doing this? Why is it so hard uh, to follow the Lord? And we have a competing system operating within a, in us. Well, it includes our worldview, our values, our desires, our attitudes, our daily behavior. This is what we're called to do in loving God, to submit and commit ourselves to Him and allow Him and His Word to shape all of our life. Now that uh, is quite a challenge. And for many of us, I think the question probably arises, where in the world does such a love come from? How do we get it? And it's a crucial question. It's one thing to sketch out what we're called to do and what the ramifications of it are. It's another thing to find the resources to carry it out. It's important to, to remind ourselves that love is not something that we originate. Love for God is not something you can work up on your own. You aren't born with it. And then you don't somehow just absorb it. Love for God, the kind of love we're talking about, is a response to something else. It is a response to God's prior love for us. And so we read in 1 John, we love because he first loved us. You see what's happening there? It's an answering love. It's not something that uh, we read that we're supposed to do and somehow we just sort of work it up. 
You could imagine that we've all seen these love stories in the movies. And, uh, you know, the, the guy and the girl meet and the guy loves this girl and because of the love he has for her, it evokes within her an answering love, right? It's a pretty familiar theme. Well, that's what we're talking about. The kind of love that we're to have for God is a love that grows out of his prior love for us. Where do we see that love? Well, we see it most clearly in the cross. And again, 1 John, we read this. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is right at the heart of it. And that is where we need to focus our thoughts again and again and again as we go through life thinking about and meditating on, pondering and reflecting on the depth of the love of God for us seen in the cross of Jesus Christ. You don't get it all at once. You go deeper in it over the years. It's helpful for us to remember, too, uh, again, because we are so inclined to think that uh, there are things about us quite lovable and adorable, and surely God should like us and love us. C.S. Lewis says, God loves us not because we are lovable, but because he is love. Not because he needs to receive, but because he delights to give. It's important to keep that in mind, that it's, it's not about us, it's about him. Well, this love then is the fruit of God's grace in our lives. It's the response, the answering love to the one who has given everything for us. And it is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the key here, the operational key, the dynamic to love for God. You can read the Bible, you can know what it says about the cross of Christ and still not have this kind of love for God apart from the Holy Spirit coming into your life and illuminating that text and setting it on fire, the truth of it and making real to you the love of God. And this is the foundation that all of us must stand on as we seek to follow Jesus Christ faithfully through this world. We need whatever circumstances we've had in life that might hinder us. We need to come to a place of knowing that we are loved by God. And once we begin to grasp this on a personal, rela or personal level, our relationship with God flourishes because we're no longer doing things because we have to. We're doing things because we want to, because we want to please the one who loves us. So I can't emphasize that strongly enough. Uh, it is crucial to seek after, if you don't have it, that revelation in your own heart of, of the love of God for you, that the Holy Spirit would make this real to you. Well, loving our neighbor is the second part of the great commandment. And let me say to start with, you cannot rightly love your neighbor if you don't first love God. Loving your neighbor in the sense that God is calling for is a fruit of first of all loving him. <clears throat> now, this business of loving our neighbor is not a matter of just being nice, kind, or polite to people. And we can easily fall into the habit of thinking, oh, I'm pretty nice to everybody, and <clears throat> I treat people well. well good. That's, that's great. But that can be explained by good, good um, you know, parental instruction and, and uh, family life. You don't need God to explain that. You don't need the Holy Spirit to produce that. There are plenty of very nice, kind, and polite pagans. 
We work around them every day, don't we? No, oh, loving your neighbor is something far more. The word for loving our neighbor is once again agape, with its focus on the will. According to one New Testament scholar, one very well-known New Testament scholar, the meaning of agape when used toward our neighbor, I quote here, is unconquerable benevolence, invincible goodwill. It is not simply a wave of emotion. It is a deliberate conviction of mind, issuing in a deliberate conquest and victory of the will. Now that... Uh, is not the way we typically think about loving our neighbor, is it? Thomas Aquinas uh, puts this in a very crisp way. To love is to will the good of another. That's pretty simple, isn't it? We can all get our heads around that. To love is to will the good of another. Another writer gives us a slightly different angle on this, very consistent, of course, with uh, Aquinas, though he says the disposition to seek the good of another. To love is to the disposition to seek the good of another. Or yet another um, scholar puts it this way, the sustained direction of my will toward the good of another. You see, all of them really are saying the same thing, but uh, with slightly different uh, nuance to them. It's a matter of the will, of choosing to act in the best interests of another person. <clears throat> now, we all have to admit the fact that some people are harder to love than others. Have you found that in your experience? I certainly have. And um, I have to say I failed more than once. Hopefully, as I continue along this path, I will fail less. John Calvin says, whatever a person is like, we still must love them because we love God. And so we can't put people into a category uh, that allows us to exempt them from this command that we love, that we love them. How do you go about loving your neighbor? Now that's a helpful thing to look at, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus gives a very clear and simple word of guidance. You find it in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter five, uh, 7, verse 12. You know this. It's called the golden rule in society. And it can become sort of commonplace to us. We hear it so much and uh, accepted, received wisdom uh, of society. But it's really a very profound idea. In everything, Jesus says, do for others what you would have them do for you. This sums up the law and the prophets. And you'll remember in Matthew 22, which we read in the beginning, Jesus said, loving God and neighbor, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Here, Jesus is bringing that phrase back in again. Um, this sums up the law and the prophets, just working to treat others the way you would like to be treated if you were in their circumstances. That is so simple, so simple, and yet so profound. And it covers, what does it not cover? It covers almost everything you can imagine. And Jesus says that in everything. So if you would program into your mind that principle. Okay, when I get in my car to drive into work, I'm going to treat these people that I'm commuting with, I'm, uh, I'm going to treat them the way I would like to be treated. Uh, these people that I find at my office, no matter what kind of office politics are going on, I'm going to treat them the way I would like to be treated. And on and on and on you go. You can apply it to everything in life. You can apply it to checking out at the grocery store. I mean, it can be very, very simple and mundane. Being polite to some checker who's been standing there for hours and uh, having to deal with rude people. Just a kind word. 
think about that. Take this one principle and just think about how to apply it to all the relationships you have, all the circumstances of life. You'll be on solid ground. Now, Jesus knows the difficulties we have in this matter of love. And um, so he's gracious and he's patient with us and he helps us. So we don't need to beat up on ourselves. We need to allow God's grace to operate in our lives when we fail uh, and to call out all the more to the Holy Spirit for help uh, to do what we're called to do. Now, C.S. Lewis gives us a helpful piece of advice in this matter uh, because many of us think this just doesn't seem right. I'm a hypocrite. I'm acting one way when I feel another way or I'm acting a certain way when I don't feel anything. Isn't that hypocrisy? No, not if you're doing it in obedience to God. Lewis puts it this way. He says, the rule for all of us is perfectly simple. Don't waste your time bothering about whether you love your neighbor. Just act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. Now, isn't that liberating? You don't have to have these warm, fuzzy feelings before you act in someone's good. Uh, You can be flat emotionally. You may even be hostile. But taking action in their good is what God calls you to do. And in the doing of his word, it brings a change in our inner life and our emotional life. And I don't know if you've experienced this before, but I certainly have. uh, Dealing with people that I did not like. People who were worthy of contempt because of the way they lived. Really what you would call disgusting and, and rotten people. I have known people like that. And Uh, I have found that in doing good to people like that, not because I felt like it, not because I thought they deserved it, but just in obedience to the word of God brought a change in my heart. Perhaps it was a witness to them, I don't know. But I certainly know that it changed me and my attitude uh, toward them. And it demonstrates the love of God. That's something we really need to get hold of. Now, we suggest here the idea of... um, Loving our neighbor, who is my neighbor, is a a very important question. And it's one that Jesus had to uh, respond to one day. The question came from uh, one of these um, clever people who uh, was trying to, actually, he had asked Jesus a question and he didn't like the answer he got. And so he was trying to find a way to evade it, Uh, this business of loving one's neighbor is a bit much, he thought. And so who is my neighbor was the question that he posed. And Jesus answered by telling the very famous story of the Good Samaritan. I would encourage you to read it. It's in the 10th chapter of Luke's gospel. But basically the point of that story is we are to love our neighbor and our neighbor is anyone in our path who needs our help, even an enemy. And thus Jesus universalizes the command and makes it apply to everyone. So loving our enemies is something we don't really like to hear about today and certainly uh, in the very polarized environment we live in, uh, it's not a popular concept. But Jesus speaks very clearly to the issue and he says, love your enemies. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Isn't that a shocking idea? You should make a list of the people you consider to be your enemies and begin to pray for them. C.S. Lewis did this. Uh, On his list in his era was um, um, Hitler and Stalin and 
two or three people that he worked with at uh, Maudlin College, people he rubbed shoulders with every day. Well, we all have people like that in our lives, don't, don't we? And so we should make a list and pray for them. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your heavenly Father. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God treats his enemies with love, and so we are called to do the same. This is challenging, no question about it. It's difficult to get our heads around this idea, but it's what we're called to do. Loving our enemies is part of loving our neighbor. A final focus this morning is loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. They have a special status, really. They are our neighbors, but they are special neighbors, you might say. They're children of God. They're part of the family of faith. And Jesus gives us what he calls a new command. And so this is something added to loving God and your neighbor. It's a, it's a falls under loving your neighbor, but it's a special category, you might say. And he says this in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And you see, that's the, that's the new part. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And he says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The kind of love he's talking about here, he refers to uh, just a little bit uh, farther ahead in chapter 15. He says, this um, really is... Uh, the kind of love that I'm talking about, laying down your life, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. He was about to demonstrate this by going to the cross, laying down his life for them, laying down his life for us. He's saying that is the kind of love that should be the norm among believers that we love one another the way he has loved us. It was this kind of sacrificial love that the early believers had for one another, along with the love that they had for their neighbors, their pagan neighbors, that arrested the attention of the pagan world and drew them to the gospel and to the church. It's a very interesting thing when you look at early church history, you'll see that uh, we start off on the day of Pentecost with 120 people in an upper room um, filled with fear of the Jews, but praying for God's grace and for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes, empowers them, fills them with love, and off they go into the world. Fast forward 300 years, they've gone through unbelievable hardship, difficulty, persecution, many put to death for their faith. But they are 10% of the population of the Roman Empire. Can you believe that? In just three centuries, from 120 to 10% of the population of the Roman Empire, which at that point was about 60 million people. So uh, that's a pretty significant growth curve. And it didn't happen just uh, by people showing up at church on Sunday and um, sitting and listening for an hour, hour and a half, and then going about their business. These people were totally committed and living a life of love. And God used that to really awaken those who were sitting in, in darkness and draw them to the truth. It's this kind of love that will reach the pagans in our day. It's not easy, but it's definitely possible if we make our chief priority in life to love God and to love our neighbor. If we live in community, a worshiping community that is God-centered, it is light in the darkness. Growing in love for God and our neighbor, that's what we need to uh, conclude with here. As we've seen, love for God and neighbor is the fruit of saving grace in our lives. 
And so the program starts off with um, the grace of God and true conversion. You will see and understand then the rationale for the next section being on discipleship and making a total commitment to follow Christ. There's a logic in the way this whole thing is designed. Uh, loving God and our neighbor is the fruit of saving grace. It's not something, as I said, that we work up on our own. It's poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit at new birth. And the more we grasp this, the more we grasp the depth of God's love for us through giving His Son, the more we live in the love of God and experience and share the love of God. Pondering and grasping what has been done for us moves us to a profound gratitude and a giving of ourselves to the one who gave himself for us. That's what lies behind this commitment of discipleship. It's not that we've signed up for special forces and we need to sign uh, a waiver and uh, acknowledge that we know that the cost is uh, total commitment, et cetera, et cetera, and we're doing it for the cause. We're doing it for uh, some kind of religious ideology. It's not that at all. It's this matter of grasping what's been done for us and giving ourselves completely to the one who has given himself for us. Offering our bodies, as Paul says, as living sacrifices to God. And that is essential if we are to continue to grow in the grace we've received. And it's why so many people in the church do not appear to be growing and seem to be just like the people that don't come to church and don't know God because they haven't made that wholehearted commitment to follow Jesus Christ and to do His will. Having done that, though, we go on to read and study and meditate on God's Word, and we find our minds being renewed by truth and love by the Holy Spirit. This is the way we grow. Daily, we seek to obey the, what the Holy Spirit teaches us through the Word, and we find Him empowering us to refuse the impulses of that old fallen nature that we all struggle with that we are led by the Holy Spirit. And if we do that, the Holy Spirit will produce fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the character traits of Jesus himself. And our life becomes increasingly a life of love that's rich in good works, and brings glory to God. That's the kind of life that we're called to live. And that's the kind of life that we can live. May God give us grace to receive all that he has provided for us to do it. Amen.